Good morning and welcome again to the United Church of Asonet online. Our meditation this morning is, God help me to find hope in you even as I face life's challenges. And this comes from Our Daily Bread. The call to worship this morning is Psalm 111. Praise the Lord. How good it is to sing praises to our God, for he is gracious, and a song of praise is fitting. The Lord builds up Jerusalem. He gathers the outcasts of Israel. He heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. He determines the number of the stars. He gives to all of them their names. Great is our Lord and abundant in power. His understanding is beyond measure. The Lord lifts up the downtrodden. He casts the wicked to the ground. Sing to the Lord with thanksgiving. Make melody to our God on the lyre. He covers the heavens with clouds, prepares rain for the earth, makes grass grow on the hills. He gives to the animals their food and to the young ravens when they cry. His delight is not in the strength of the horse nor his pleasure in the speed of the runner. But the Lord takes pleasure in those who fear him and those who hope in his steadfast love. Praise the Lord. Our opening hymn this morning is, There is a Balm in Gilead. A sin sick soul. Sometimes I feel discouraged and think my work's in vain. But then the Holy Spirit revives my soul again. There is a balm in a to make the wounded whole, there is a balm in Gilead to heal the sin sick soul. If you cannot preach like Peter, if you cannot pray like Paul, you can tell the love of Jesus and say he died for all. There is a balm in a Gilead to make the wounded whole. There is a balm in a Gilead to heal the sin sick soul. Don't ever feel discouraged, for Jesus is your friend. And if you lack for knowledge, he'll never refuse to lend. There is a balm in a Gilead to make the wound whole. There is a balm in a Gilead to heal the sin sick soul. And now our invocation. Eternal God, creator of the universe and beyond, we call on you you who greet us here. We give you thanks for making it possible to gather and to ponder your eternal mysteries. Make us creatures of this time and space, ready collaborators with your endless grace. And let us pray as Jesus taught us by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, 
thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Ghost as it was in the beginning is now and ever shall be world without end Amen Amen Now we have a few announcements for this morning. Uh, the church flowers were given by the Moore family. The Church Council has decided to maintain virtual services through February 28th and will re-examine the plans for March at the meeting held on February 21st. Our Bible study on Paul's first letter of the Corinthians continues this week at Tuesday at 6 p.m. We'll be examining 1 Corinthians chapter 13 verses 1 to 13, that in preparation for Valentine's Day. Please email uh, my email address, revgregorynbaker at outlook.com if you would like a Zoom link or if you would like the study questions. We will be starting our Lenten series on entering the passion of Jesus by Amy Jill Levine on Tuesday, February 23rd at 6 p.m. Uh, again, please email me if you are interested. The Ecumenical Bible Series um, will begin on Wednesday, February 24th at 7 p.m. The theme this year is Health and Healing in the Bible. There will be no soup to go with our scripture this year. It will be Zoom only, but the invitation again is available if you email me. Uh, coming up uh, today, uh, sorry, it's February 21st, will be um, St. John Newman's Church's uh, virtual Lenten today, Repent and Believe in the Gospel, and you can access that uh, from their Facebook page, facebook.com slash St. John Newman Catholic Church, and that's St. S-T, not spelled out. Again, we are always looking for more all beautiful altar flowers. Uh, please call Kathy Frazier at 508-644-5448 if you would like to help. And office hours are on Friday mornings, which is also when we record the service. So if you have any prayer requests, please email them to me uh, before we make this recording. And now it is time to join together in a spirit of prayer, beginning with our joys and our concerns. We do have continued prayers today for Manny Santos, Susan Lemos, Christine Vaughn, for Gloria, Barbara Flanders, Leon Cudworth Sr., for Jack Conway, and Jen Currier. We prayers for Betty O'Leary, who had her surgery on Thursday, for Mike O'Leary, who is still in the hospital with uh, coronavirus in a bad way, and also for Rachel Abbott, also hospitalized for COVID coronavirus. And now, together in spirit, if not in location, let us pray. Holy One, our lives are often like an emotional roller coaster in a runaway car. We sometimes feel our lives are out of control, and so we often try to get control. Then we grow weary and tired, because just about everything we try to do on our own falls short. And then we give up we, then we give up, Lord. We let go, Lord. We quit trying to be in control. It is times like these that we need you, Lord. We need to commune with you to become centered and whole. We need to draw close to you to experience your healing touch. We need the support of one another, the love of one another, the encouragement of one another to remind us of your presence. It is times when we commune with you that we are then lifted up on eagle's wings. We pray for all those touched by the coronavirus and all who struggle to make our world a better place. We pray for the lonely and the lost, for the dying and the grieving, 
for the ill and the injured. We pray especially for Manny, Susan, Christine, Gloria, Barbara, Leon, Jack, Jen, Betty, Mike, and Rachel. Hear now the silent prayers of our hearts as we listen to your word for us. And Lord, when we have received our healing, may we then be a vessel for you to use to heal others. May we go about proclaiming the good news to all. May our households of faith be a gathering for those in need of healing and forgiveness. And this we pray in the name of our most holy Lord, Jesus Christ. Amen. While we may not be together, I do hope that you will continue to be generous to our church uh, during this time. As always, you can mail checks to P.O. Box 155, Assonant, Massachusetts, 02702, or give by PayPal at uccassonant.com. Uh, if you are truly interested, we can mail you a uh, pledge kit with some weekly envelopes as well. Uh, so please send that request to the P.O. Box number. And now let us think about the times that God has come to us in a moment of meditation. How quiet is the night How pleasant is the day of the Lord. I feel his holy power day and night, every moment, every hour. What a peaceful feeling comes on me. This lesson this morning comes from Paul's first letter to the Corinthians, chapter 9, verses 16 to 23. If I proclaim the gospel, this gives me no ground for boasting, for an obligation is laid on me, and woe betide me if I do not proclaim the gospel. For if I do this of my own will, I have a reward. But if not of my own will, I am entrusted with a commission. What then is my reward? Just this 
that in my proclamation I may make the gospel free of charge so as not to make full use of my rights in the gospel. For though I am free with respect to all, I have made myself a slave to all so that I might win more of them. To the Jews I became as a Jew in order to win Jews. To those under the law I became as one under the law, though I myself am not under the law, so that I might win those under the law. To those outside the law I became as one outside the law, though I am not free from God's law, but under Christ's law, so that I might win those outside the law. To the weak I became weak, so that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all people, so that I might by any means save some. I do it all for the sake of the gospel, so that I may share in its blessings. Our gospel lesson this morning comes from the gospel according to Mark, chapter 1, verses 21 to 28. As soon as they left the synagogue, they entered the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. Now Simon's mother-in-law was in bed with a fever, and they told him about her at once. He came and took her by the hand and lifted her up. Then the fever left her, and she began to serve them. That evening at sundown, they brought to him all who were sick or possessed by demons. And the whole city was gathered around the door. And he cured many who were sick with various diseases and cast out many demons. And he would not permit the demons to speak because they knew him. In the morning, while it was still very dark, he got up and went out to a deserted place. And there he prayed. And Simon and his companions hunted for him. When they found him, they said to him, Everyone is searching for you. He answered, Let us go on to the neighboring towns, so that I may proclaim the message there also. For that is what I came out to do. And he went throughout Galilee, proclaiming the message in their synagogues and casting out demons. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Today is the last ordinary Sunday during the Epiphany season, before Transfiguration and Lent. Now, you may recall that all throughout this season, we have looked at different ways in which Jesus calls us to love and serve him. We heard of how Jesus called Nathanael, the Israelite in whom there is no deceit, and of the fishermen who left everything to follow Jesus. In all these stories, people are living their normal lives when they encounter Jesus and decide to become his disciples. But not everyone is immediately ready to answer that call. Many are in dark or painful places. But this does not mean that they are ignoring or rejecting God. And when you find yourself in these circumstances, when your faith and your hope seem farthest from you, that is when we discover that God meets you where you are. Let me share a few stories about this that that I've discovered. The first comes from a health and faith blogger named Megan. Megan was raised as a Mormon, but had a crisis of faith when she came down with a mysterious, debilitating illness. She writes, I question if there was a point to this life, if my pain could have a purpose. And why bad things happen to good people. I questioned if God truly loved me, because if he loved me, why would he let me be so sick? If my illness was some sort of wrath-filled punishment, because I wasn't good enough. Or if he just didn't care that I suffer. I honestly got to the point where I questioned if there was even a God at all. Megan's biggest crisis of faith came on the day before she was going to get a feeding tube put into her. She says, I remember lying on that hospital bed, feeling like I could honestly die in that ER bay. I remember over and over telling myself that God must not exist because someone all-powerful who supposedly loved me would never let me feel like this. My hope was gone, my faith was demolished, my body was just barely holding on. 
and my world had never felt so dark. But a still, small voice kept gnawing inside me, begging and pleading me to pray. So with nothing to lose, I bowed my head and absolutely poured my whole soul out in prayer. I felt this warmth and this love that I had never felt anything like before. I was like all those parts of my soul that were so black were all of a sudden bursting with light. And even though I had never been so physically weak, that week and a half in the hospital, I was able to move forward with a strength that most definitely wasn't my own. Because of her painful illness, Megan felt abandoned, even punished by God. But in her time of deepest despair, when all the walls of anger and disappointment were raised about her heart, she let go, surrendering her fear to that still small voice and finding that God had met her where she was. Another story comes from Paula Darcy, author and president of the Red Bird Foundation, which supports growth and spiritual development for those in need. In 1975, Paula was pregnant with her second child when her husband and 21-month-old daughter died in a car accident. Understandably, Paula was distraught and angry at God in the world. One day she got an anonymous pamphlet in the mail for people who grieve. She was furious. As she said in an interview in the Houston Chronicle, I had just buried my husband and daughter and I'm pregnant and you th really think a booklet is going to dissolve my pain? And so she threw the pamphlet on the floor. But several days later, as she was roaming her house, unable to sleep, she found it and picked it up and read it, just to get out of her own thoughts for just a minute. And she read that if you go deeper than your pain, you would arrive at a place of great strength. And she wanted that to be true. She wanted it to be true more than anything. And she prayed for God to show her a way through her grief to that strength. And in that moment, she felt that she was not alone. She, read to having, she said, having opened to that possibility, I began to see ordinary things in a different way. Things had meaning. It was almost like connecting the dots, seeing things I would normally have just walked past. My despair that night made me teachable in that moment. Like Megan, Paula had felt alone and abandoned by life. But in accepting the presence of God at her lowest moment, she was reminded that she was not alone and that God's presence and love was indeed all around her. Again, God met her where she was. The last story I want to tell you this morning is about a journalist named Brian Mueller. Unlike Megan and Paula, Brian's crisis of faith was not immediate, but rather grew over time. When he turned 40, Brian realized that he was becoming more isolated from his friends and his faith. Brian had been raised in the Assemblies of God, a Pentecostal denomination, and while his relatives found much solace in their faith, he found much of their preaching to be judgmental, divisive, and at times politically motivated. Brian had seen a course, had been a correspondent in Eastern Congo, covering a war that had been forgotten here in the West. And he'd seen massacres and disease and the burials of many children. Time after time, he would hear the grieving family say it's God's will and that God must be punishing them for their unbelief. Finally, after visiting a tent where many infants had died that night before and hearing again, it's God's will, Brian snapped. As he wrote in a piece for The Guardian, then I want no part of this God, he, I thought. As I stood in a haze of cooking fires at the forgotten edge of the world, that God ceased to exist. Now, later for his job, Brian interviewed David Peter, a Episcopal priest and army chaplain. Feeling the need for a friend, David invited, Brian invited David to go on morning runs with him. 
And so they, as they ran, they would talk of history and politics and theology. And David shared his own experience in finding faith in dark times. David had grown up in an evangelical church tradition and joined the Marines. And after observing the horrors of war in Iraq, David returned home to find that his wife and children had left him. In his misery, he turned to the work of another military chaplain, the famous 20th century theologian, Paul Tillich. Like Brian and David, Tillich's faith had been shattered by the horrors of war when he was a military chaplain in the World War I. But there at rock bottom, Tillich came to see that God was indeed all around him, providing what he called the ground of being for all things. He found a God who met him in his darkness. In his book, The Shaking of the Foundations, Tillich wrote this, Grace strikes us when we are in great pain and restlessness. It strikes us when we walk through the dark valley of a meaningless, empty life. It strikes us when we feel that our separation is deeper than usual because we have violated another life, a life that we loved or from which we were estranged. It strikes us when our disgust for our own being, our indifference, our weakness, our hostility, and our lack of direction and composure has become intolerable for us. It strikes when year after year the longed-for perfection of life does not appear, when the old compulsions reign within us as they have for decades, when despair destroys all joy and courage. Sometimes at that moment a wave of light breaks into our darkness, and it is through a voice, it is, it, and it is as though a voice were saying, You are accepted. After such an experience, we may not be better than before. We may not believe more than before. But everything is transformed. In that moment, grace conquers sin, and reconciliation bridges the gulf of estrangement. And nothing is demanded of this experience, no religious or moral or intellectual supposition, nothing but acceptance. In the light of this grace, we perceive the power of grace in our relation to others and to ourselves. We experience the grace of being able to look frankly into the eyes of another, the miraculous grace of reunion of life with life. We experience the grace of understanding each other's words. Now David, on a night when he was alone and sobbing and cursing God, heard that still, small voice and found that grace as well, just as Tillich said he would. And David then shared his experience with Brian, who then began to see God differently in his own doubts. David and then Brian realized that the God of requirements and judgments of their youth no longer spoke to their experiences. Instead, their God was the God who appeared in their anxiety and their doubt, who met them where they were, in the dark and the pain, to show them the light and the healing all around them. Both men ended up finding solace in new congregations. David in the liturgical traditions of the Episcopal Church, and Brian in the progressive welcome of a United Methodist Church. In these stories of Megan, Paula, David, and Brian, people in the depths of greatest doubt and despair found God not as a majestic heavenly father or a wrathful judge of sin, but as the one who came to heal their brokenness in the dark of night. In our lesson today from the Gospel according to Mark, Jesus is brought by Peter to heal Peter's mother-in-law. It says he came and took her by the hand and lifted her up, and then her fever left her. That night, the whole city of Capernaum was brought to be healed in body and in mind. But the next morning, Jesus left, saying, Let us go on to the neighboring towns, so that I may proclaim the message there also. For that is what I came out to do. And Jesus knew that there was as much suffering throughout Galilee as there was in Capernaum. And Jesus, our God made flesh, wanted to meet that suffering where it was. 
God does indeed come to us when we are alone in the dark. But often, there is a person who helps us see God or prepares us to discover God ourselves. Peter brought Jesus to his mother-in-law. Someone set, sent that anonymous pamphlet to Paula. Tillich's experience in the war became an example for David and then for Brian to hear their own silent voices. Our first lesson, in our first lesson from Paul's first letter to the Corinthians, he indicates how far he is willing to go to bring that message of love and comfort to those around him. He writes, For though I am free with respect to all, I have made myself a slave to all, so that I might win more of them. To the Jews, I became as a Jew. To those under the law, I became as one under the law. To those outside the law, I became as one outside the law. To the weak, I became weak. I have become all things to all people, that I might by all means save some. I do it all for the sake of the gospel, so that I may share in its blessings. Paul has been in that dark place and wants all to see the divine love that he has seen. He'll do anything to make that happen. God is always calling to us. Sometimes it is through the voice of tradition or through the voice of wisdom that we find in our religious leaders. Sometimes it is still, it is through that still small voice. And sometimes it is in the sight of another in need or in pain. Whether we grew up in a church or found our faith later in life or returned to our faith after a lapse, we all have known those dark times and felt that doubt and loneliness. And each time when we tore down those walls that we had placed around our heart to protect ourselves from that hurt, we found that God was already there with us. Our mission as Christians is not only to feel God's love in our lives, it's to grow that love in the people in the world around us. We might do this through sharing stories of our struggle, as you've heard some stories today, or by inviting someone to share an experience with us, or simply by being a loving friend to those in need, just listening to their pain, just being there for them. God has called us and is calling us still across all the suffering and the wretchedness of the world to feel God's presence and to bring God's love to all we meet. And as we prepare to do this in the coming week, let us pray. Lord of grace and love, meet us in the dark times and lonely places of our lives. Bring us that peace which surpasses all understanding. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Our communion hymn this morning is Let Us Break Bread Together. my face to the rising sun. O Lord, have mercy on me. Let us drink wine together on our knees. Let us drink wine together my face to the rising sun. O Lord, have mercy on me. Let us praise God together. We 
with my face to the rising sun. O Lord, have mercy on me. Beloved in Christ, the Gospel tells us that on the first day of the week, Jesus Christ was raised from death, appeared to Mary Magdalene, and on that same day sat at the table with two disciples and was made known to them in the breaking of the bread. This is the joyful feast of the people of God. Men and women, youth and children, come from the east and from the west, from the north and the south, and gather about Christ's table. This table is for all Christians who wish to know the presence of Christ and to share in the communion of God's people. May God be with you. Lift up your hearts to God and freely give God your thanks and praise. It is right and meet beautiful and holy that we should in ceaseless joy give our thanks and praise to you, holy and merciful God, through Jesus Christ our Savior. And so in grateful possession of endless praise, with the church that is and was and shall be forever, we glorify you, joining in this unending song of holy, 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 Lord God of majesty, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you, eternal one, you sit above and through within the circle of the earth, setting light into being, casting the stars in the sky, founding the evolving earth and all that dwell within it. Limitless is your power and great is your wisdom. You look upon the lowly as your most cherished creatures. You visit upon the downtrodden with presence, grace, and the promise of eternal justice. You sent to us your own child, Jesus, who reached into the unexpected places, calling women beyond the limits of their times, equipping men for nurturing love, welcoming children into your holy embrace. And we remember that on the night of betrayal and desertion, Jesus took the bread, gave thanks, broke the bread, and gave it to the disciples saying, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, Jesus took also the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink of it in remembrance of me. Life's greatest feast is before us. And so we excitedly proclaim that Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. Dear God, you transform all that is before you, so that the touch of your grace we are never the same. Dear God, you illumine us, bringing light to all people, light to the nations, light into our hearts, light on your way. Dear God, we pray for your spirit. Transform, illumine, bless. Make these ordinary gifts of bread and cup into the extraordinary presence of Christ within us. In so doing, hold us as your own, Renew us as your people for the sake of the world you love. For all honor and glory are yours, O God, through Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit in your glorious creation, both now and forever. Amen. Through the broken bread, we participate in the body of Christ. Whatever you may have in hand, take and eat. Through the cup of blessing, we participate in the new life Christ brings. Whatever you may have at hand, take and drink. And finally, let us pray. We have been fed, Holy One, by your presence. We have been led, Eternal One, by your life. May we bask in this glow now and forevermore. Amen. Our closing hymn this morning is Where Cross the Crowded Ways of Life.
sound the cries of race and clan above the noise of selfish strife we hear thy voice o son of man in haunts of wretchedness and need on shadowed thresholds dark with fears from paths where hide the lures of greed we catch the vision of thy tears from tender childhood's helplessness from a woman's grief, man's burden to toil, from famished souls, from sorrow's stress, thy heart has never known a recoil. The cup of water given for thee still holds the freshness of thy grace yet long these multitudes to see the sweet compassion of thy face O Master from the mountain side Make haste to heal these hearts of pain Among these restless throngs abide O oh, tread the city's streets again Till sons of men shall learn thy love and follow where thy feet have trod till glorious from thy heaven above shall come the city of our God And now, may God bless and keep you. May God's face shine through yours. And may the glorious God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit protect and keep you forever. Amen. Blessed be the tie that binds our hearts in Christian love. The fellowship of kindred minds is like to that of